Hello, thank you very much for watching my channel. My name's Stuart, classical record enthusiast, classical music lover, primarily Mozart, and um, professional dealer. I was a dealer in the in the 90s. I I kind of withdrew from dealing from about 2002. I went into something else, but uh, I'm back in records, hoping to uh, buy and sell once again, but also build up my collection. I'm going to be telling us stories about when I was a dealer. I've got lots of entertaining, unusual stories to tell, and I'm going to tell one today that won't take too long. I hope you'll find it amusing. And uh, But before I start, I'm going to probably, um, when I make videos, I'm going to present to you my sort of favorite LPs of the moment that I've been listening to recently. So, and why? So I picked this one up from a charity shop. It's Gardner conducting Mozart's 31st and 34th symphonies on Philips Classics, a uh, digital classics. Now, I remember Hungarian when I was in Hungary in the 90s telling me that he prefers Gardner as a conductor to many like Karajan, Karl Böhm, and various other great conductors when it comes to Mozart he actually prefers John Elliott Gardner I was just getting into John Elliott Gardner at the time and um, you know listening to this brought, brought it all back Symphony number no. 31 in particular Mozart is, uh, worked his music down to the last detail everything is so precise uh, a pianist once said to me the difference between um, a Mozart trill and a Brahms trill in a sonata or a concerto is that in Mozart, the trill is worked down to the very last note, you know, you count them. Whereas in Brahms, it's a bit flexible, for example, and everything is so, has got to be incredibly precise with Mozart. And Gardner really does it. It's, it's um, you can hear everything. Everything is in exactly the right place. Uh, I think the speed is to perfection. And uh, it sounds very fresh, particularly with the uh, mod um, uh, authentic instruments. It sounds very fresh. It sounds, it sounds bright. It's almost like you're hearing it for the first time. And it's very satisfying to listen to. So, I mean, the Paris Symphony is an absolutely phenomenal work. Mozart was in Paris. He wanted to impress the Parisians. And he certainly does that. It's got two middle movements here that's my only gripe i prefer the original version which should really just be three movements and mozart wrote a substitute andante because apparently uh, the Paris parisians didn't like his undone his original andante very much and he, he wrote a second one to suit their taste and i'm not too sure why but <laughs> they've included both movements next to each other on this record so you've got to wait for the fabulous allegro to be to start Symphony number no. 34 as well, a symphony which I've never really been 100% keen on, is really um, exciting listening to this. I mean, the brass, uh, the winds and everything, and, you know, the bite on the violins, it's uh, it's an exceptional record. So if you've not heard that before, I certainly suggest that, that you have a listen to it. Okay, I won't be selling that one anyway. Let me just move on to the anecdote. All right, so I... <clears throat> I opened, I opened, uh, no, I won't go into the whole story about how I became a classical record dealer. I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you what happened. Okay. So obviously all dealers, we buy and sell. And I advertised in Gramophone Magazine, Classical CD. I advertised locally. I also had a shop with an A board outside asking for records and CDs, tapes, whatever that, whatever I could sell really. So I had a phone, I had a phone call from a guy um, in the north of London I was living in Nottingham at the time. That's where my shop was. We're talking about, I think, 1993, 1994, quite a while ago. I was in my late, I was born in 64. So, yeah, I was about 30-ish then. I'm 59 now, double the age. <laughs> um, double the age, not necessarily any wiser, though. Yeah, so this gentleman had a large collection of CDs, a lot of opera, and opera sold well in those days. I mean, opera sets, you know, they were really good sellers. So he had a lot of opera and he had just a really good collection. He had about, um, he had several hundred anyway, three, four hundred, maybe. It would have been, I think he had about 300 in total with all the opera sets. And he was in Hemel Hempstead. I gave him a rough idea of what I pay, you know, 
I mean, I said for opera sets, mostly I pay about a fiver a piece, uh, give or take a pound. And for individual CDs, for full price CDs, I pay about two pounds. And for budget CDs, I pay a pound. And he said, mm, OK, you know, come down and give me a price and we'll see if we can do something. So, yeah, I went down with the cash. Now, I usually go with more cash than I think I'm going to need, just in case, because you never know. And if it's any good, I don't like to come back without something. So even if there's going to be some hard bargaining and I've got to pay a little bit more than I really want to, then I would usually pay it if necessary. So I drove down uh, in the evening. I drove down in the evening. I got there. He lived in a quite a fashionable part of... I don't know, I think it was Hamel Hempstead or something like that. Quite a nice part of just north of London or North London. And I went in, everything was there. He'd he'd piled them up on his table. He had a big coffee table. And he'd separated out the opera, opera sets from, you know, other CDs and everything. I had my own way of dividing them up. And, I mean, the way I used to operate is that I would divide up according to what I was going to pay. So everything that's a fiver is going to be in this pile. Everything that's a pound is going to be in that pile. Everything that's two pounds is going to be in that pile or whatever. So I divided everything up, opera sets, what and what have you. Yeah. And then I got, I had a pen and pad I used to carry around with me to do calculations. And I also had a little calculator. So in order to be transparent about the price I was giving him, you know, I said, okay, th these are your opera sets. I'm happy to pay five pounds a piece on those. And, you know, and I said, I I've averaged it out because some I wouldn't be prepared to pay a fiver, but then there are others I would be prepared to pay more than five. Like if it's an opera set, I'm only prepared to pay three pounds for, then I put that in the five pound pile, but there might be another set I'm prepared to pay seven or eight pounds for. So I explained to him, it all averages out and a fiver a set. <laughs> and... Yep, so I calculated how many opera sets are there and I you know wrote that down. I calculated calculated everything out and then with my, and then I tabulated everything and I worked it out and I made it all transparent. I said, Okay, right and I gave him the total and I said, Look, you know, I've worked it all out here. You see this you've got this number of opera sets you've got and I said, This is how I've worked it out. You can check it if you want and you can count how many you know, just to make sure I've done the counting correctly. And it came to I don't know, let's say, uh, I mean, for the sake of argument, I can't remember how much exactly it was, but let's say it came to, say, £1,300, okay? £1,300. And he looked at it, he was happy, I got the money out, and I paid, okay? So I paid, and um, I had a little sort of receipt that he had to sign, and, you know, I got a signature off him. Put all the CDs in my car... And I was on my way. All right. So I had a two-hour drive back to Nottingham, maybe a bit less than that. I had a two-hour drive back. I was feeling quite happy, quite cheerful, quite pleased with myself. I thought, oh, I know. I'll stop for some um, fish and chips on the way back at the uh, service station, at Watford Gap or wherever. <laughs> and as I was driving, I suddenly started to sweat. And, you know, I was sweating so much I could actually feel it on my body <laughs> and there were beads of sweat appearing on my forehead. Something is not right. Something is not right. Why am I not happy? And I thought, um, I pulled over, I pulled the car over and I got the pad out. I thought, how could I pay 1300 for those? There's only like 300 CDs there. How did I end up paying that, that amount of money? I thought, I sort of did a rough calculation in my head. I thought, no, it shouldn't be that much. I mean, that means I've paid like, you know, on average four pounds per CD. And it couldn't be because there are budgets here that only pay a pound for. And I thought, no, something's, something, something's not right with this. And I went out, I got my pad, I went to my boot and I started checking through. I actually started, I, th I had to pull out all the opera sets. And I thought, well, well, how many opera sets? I count the opera sets. I thought, oh my God. You know, I've put down, I've put down here that he's got, um, you know, like 100 opera sets. And in reality, he hasn't got 100 opera sets. Uh, he's got far less than that. I, I mean, he's got like, it was 40 opera sets or something. Why did I put down 100 opera sets? What the hell? And, um, 
Yeah, I realised I'd overpaid him by about, I think, £300. £300. And I looked at the other thing. Oh, I got those right. I got the budgets right. I got the, you know, the rest of it. Everything seems to be fine except the opera sets. Why the hell did I... I miscounted or I wrote down the wrong number for some odd reason. I don't know. A lapse in concentration. It was very unusual for me to make errors of any kind whatsoever. <laughs> but I realised I'd overpaid him £300. Uh, there was no doubt about it. I went over the figures two or three times. And, you know, as I went over the figures more, I started to sweat more. I was dripping in, <laughs> I was dripping in sweat thinking, oh, my God, you know, what was a good, what had been a good deal to the extent I was thinking of going and getting fish and chips at Watford Gap. I mean, as things stood, I felt like starving myself for three days. <laughs> so I got back in my car and I thought, you clot. Yeah, I thought, well, I'll have to live with it. You know, I mean, we've done the deal now. There's nothing really much that I can do. So I, I was driving away, but I was I was in such a kind of uh, fury with myself over this error. And I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, um, I agreed with him I'd paid him a cer I, that I would pay him a certain amount per set and everything. And there's been a counting error. There's been a counting error, error and I've not paid him what I agreed eff effectively what I would pay him. And um, I decided to turn around. I knew that I either wouldn't open the door or if he did open the door, he would probably say, look, the deal's done. So I decided to come, I decided to drive back. I felt really aw awkward about it, but I had to balance the wretched state that I was in <laughs> over this like overpayment of 300 quid, which in those days, by the way, it's like 600 now because of inflation. So it was quite a bit of money. Uh, I'd still make money out of the deal, but it really would sour the whole thing for me. So I went back and I knocked on his door. He came to the door. Uh, he was surprised to see me. I must admit, he sort of said, oh, are you back? I said, yeah, uh, could I come in for a moment, please? He said, well, all right then. Anyway, so I went in. I had I had my pad. I said, look, you know, um, I'll just be, I'll, I'll be blunt with you. Um, I miscounted the opera CDs. I've put down here that you've got 100. In fact, you only had 40. And it was a blunder on my part, but obviously uh, we agreed to pay you based on a certain scheme of, of pricing. And I made a counting error and I've, I've overpaid you by 300 pounds. And I've, cu I've come to get that money back. I hope that's okay with you because then we'll be, you know, everything will be fine. Anyway, he was kind of, he looked really confused. And while I was standing there, I looked, I looked through into the, his lounge and I saw the coffee table and I saw the money I'd paid him sitting on the coffee table. Well, while he was kind of trying to work out what on earth I was saying, <laughs> I went into that room and I counted out for myself 300 pounds. And I said, look, here's a 300. So we're square now. I put it into my pocket. <laughs> I went to the door, opened it, and he came after me. And he said, really annoyed and irritated, is that it now? Is the deal actually finalized or are you going to come back for more money? I said, no, everything's fine, thank you. We're completely square. It's been nice doing business with you. And I walked, I went straight to my car. Um, I drove to Watford Gap. I had fish and chips after all. <laughs> I got back, I got home and got the CDs out and everything was absolutely fine. But I wonder, what would you have done in that situation? I've told that story to a couple of friends and, you know, I think some of them have said they would have just swallowed it because a deal is a deal. And you must admit, it's quite an awkward position to be in. But anyway, there it is. I don't know if you find that interesting, but I've got more stories of that type. So, uh, yeah, 300 quid. I made a good I made a good profit out of that deal, but it taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson to be very, very careful and double check, double count. Yeah double count even get the seller to count to be absolutely certain that everything is worked out down to the last penny okay thanks for watching i'll be back with another video soon goodbye